Dead America. The Incident in Rosalia. Part 1. By Derek Slayton. Chapter 1. Day 0 plus 56. In the small northern Spokane suburb of Fairwood, Sergeant Carter lounged in the back of a pickup truck, cradling his morning coffee. Despite the dawn light casting a warm glow on the residential street, he kept his sunglasses on. Two months of relentless duty had taken its toll. Everywhere he turned, there was a task demanding attention. Zombies to be eradicated, corpses to be disposed of, fortifications to be built and manned. The burnout was palpable, exacerbated by his own misstep. Just yesterday, during a routine house inspection, he stumbled upon a quarter bottle of whiskey. Though he initially intended to share it with his men, that resolve quickly dissolved with the warmth of the first sip. An hour later, he found himself sprawled out, unconscious. As he sat there, nursing his coffee, his second-in-command, Corporal Armstrong, approached. With a sharp rap on the side of the truck, the metallic clang pierced the air. Jesus Christ Armstrong, are you trying to kill me? Sergeant Carter exclaimed. Carter sat up, his free hand instinctively moving to his head, attempting to soothe the throbbing ache. No, Sergeant, not trying to kill you. Just sending a warning shot your way, Corporal Armstrong retorted, his tone laced with jest. A warning shot, huh? For what exactly? Carter inquired, rubbing his temple. For not sharing what gave you a hangover, Armstrong replied with a hint of reproach. Carter pondered for a moment before conceding. Yeah, you're right. The next bottle I find, I'll hand straight to you to share among the men. Hey now, we don't have to go crazy. I'm perfectly okay just sharing with you, Armstrong chuckled. Carter managed a half laugh, despite the discomfort it caused him. So, now that you're back from Central Command, what's on the agenda this morning? The warden over at the prison camp is expecting us, Armstrong informed. Expecting us for what? Carter inquired curiously. I don't know, an inspection? Armstrong suggested uncertainly. Great, I can't wait to stroll down the hallways of the local high school to see a bunch of guys in orange shirts staring back at me from homeroom, Carter remarked sarcastically. Probably. But Captain Page asked about it yesterday when I saw her, and I told her that we would get it checked off the list today, Armstrong explained. I swear to God, her list just keeps growing and growing. If I didn't know better, I'd say that a thousand soldiers isn't quite big enough to handle doing the cleanup and inventory of Spokane, Carter grumbled. It could be worse. At least we're not on the front lines, Armstrong countered. What front lines? Most of the force is living it up in Seattle. Power, gas, food, Carter retorted. Oh hell, did nobody tell you? Armstrong's tone turned serious. Tell me what? Carter demanded. I swear, I go to Central Command for a couple of days and everything falls apart, Armstrong joked. Armstrong. Tell me what? Carter pressed. You know that shipment of ammunition we were supposed to get from our guys down in Boise? Armstrong began. Yeah? Carter responded, his tone wary. The militia got it. Armstrong dropped the bombshell. Motherfucker. Did we know anybody on the team? Carter yelled. Yeah, one name stuck out. Alvarez, Armstrong confirmed. Did he make it? Carter asked, despite assuming the answer. Armstrong paused, a solemn expression crossing his face as he shook his head. Carter let out a huffing grunt, barely containing his anger. Those sons of bitches, Carter spat out. I know you two were close, Armstrong acknowledged quietly. That's an understatement, Armstrong. Came up through basic together, spent a couple of tours in the sandbox together. We'd swap stories every night about the shit we survived. All so he could bite it up here. It's not right, Carter lamented, his voice heavy with grief and frustration. I know it's not right. But Captain Page is working on a response, Armstrong offered. Carter sat up abruptly his gaze piercing as he focused on Armstrong. And I volunteered us, Armstrong continued, bracing himself for Carter's reaction. Damn right you did, Carter affirmed. But I had to lie on your behalf, Armstrong confessed. 
Carter paused, giving Armstrong a scrutinizing look. You better explain yourself, Corporal, Carter demanded sternly. I don't know why she asked, but she was very adamant that I didn't know anybody on the runner team. I guess the higher-ups don't want there to be an escalation, Armstrong explained hesitantly. Sergeant Carter's anger boiled over, evident in his voice as he sat up straight. An escalation? They're concerned with an escalation? The militia declared war on us, killed our brothers, and took what was ours, Carter growled. Carter paused, the fiery anger simmering beneath the surface as he fought to maintain control. He took a series of deep breaths, steadying himself before speaking again. We're at war with an enemy at our doorsteps, but because they're not the ones being killed, the brass doesn't care, he declared bitterly. Corporal Armstrong nodded solemnly, meeting Carter's gaze with unwavering resolve. So what are you going to do about it, Sergeant? Armstrong inquired, his voice steady. I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to hunt down those responsible and wipe them out. You can't have an escalation if there's nobody left standing on the other side, Carter asserted. And that's why I'll follow you into battle anywhere, Armstrong affirmed, his loyalty unwavering. Come on, let's get to Central Command so we can hit the road, Carter declared, leaping down from the back of the truck. Armstrong, however, remained rooted to the spot, wearing a perplexed expression. Didn't you hear me, Armstrong? Let's get a move on, Carter urged impatiently. Aren't you forgetting something? Armstrong prompted. No, I don't think I am, Carter replied tersely. The warden, Armstrong reminded him. Carter shook his head in frustration, cursing under his breath. We're at war, and I have to go watch a dog and pony show before I can start fighting back, Carter grumbled. If it makes you feel any better, we have to go by there anyway, since I told the rest of the squad to meet us there, Armstrong said. Yeah, fine, whatever. Let's get this bull out of the way, Carter conceded begrudgingly. Come on, I'll drive, Armstrong suggested. Carter continued to grumble to himself as he settled into the passenger seat of Armstrong's truck. The drive took them ten minutes, navigating through the suburb to reach the school. Approaching the school grounds, they could see makeshift barbed wire fences encircling the perimeter, with a small contingent of guards stationed around. As they neared the parking lot, a couple of guards signaled for them to proceed. So, did the good captain say what the purpose of our visit here is? Carter inquired, his tone dripping with sarcasm. Just a routine inspection, as far as I can tell, Armstrong replied. Yep, this is totally worthy of my time, Carter muttered. The two men pulled up alongside another vehicle parked alone in the lot. Standing beside it were four young soldiers dressed in military attire. Private Hoffman, Private Yang, Private Summers, and Private Clayton, all in their early 20s, had proven their mettle during the invasion of Spokane. Assigned to Sergeant Carter after his main squad was decimated by infection, they were recruits who hadn't even completed basic yet. Despite their green status, all four had exceeded Carter's expectations. Under his tutelage, they had transformed into a formidable fighting unit. Carter had risked his life on numerous occasions to protect them, and in return, their loyalty to him was unwavering. As Carter and Armstrong exited the vehicle, determined to expedite the inspection, all four soldiers straightened up at the sight of their sergeant, their faces lighting up with respect and admiration. Boys ready for a hell of a day? Sergeant Carter's voice rang out. You know it, Sergeant, Private Hoffman replied eagerly. Good, because it's going to be one for the books, Carter declared, a spark of excitement in his eyes. The men exchanged puzzled glances. Aren't we inspecting the prison? Private Yang asked. Not sure that would qualify as a banner day, Sarge, Private Summers chimed in. Forget about the prison. We'll be out of here in 30. Then the real mission begins, Carter assured them. Private Clayton leaned forward. Curiosity peaked. Well, don't keep us in suspense, Sarge. What are we doing? We're going on a militia hunt, Carter announced. The excitement in the air was palpable as all four men nodded, exchanging fist bumps. It's about time. I heard about what they did to our convoy from Idaho, Private Hoffman remarked grimly. Glad you're all on board, 
Armstrong here is going to fill you in on the situation while I go take care of this bullshit, Carter stated, gesturing towards his second in command. Carter gave Armstrong a firm pat on the shoulder, signaling for him to elaborate on the details they had discussed earlier. With purposeful strides, Carter hastened his pace towards the school building, where two additional guards stood watch. As he approached, they promptly opened the door, revealing Warden Dawson standing inside. The middle-aged man, with graying hair and a no-nonsense demeanor, still exuded an imposing presence at over six feet tall. Welcome, Sergeant. I appreciate you coming down this morning. Come on in, Warden Dawson greeted, gesturing for Carter to enter. Carter stepped through the doorway, scanning the area to find a handful of prisoners clad in orange shirts engaged in menial tasks under the watchful eye of guards. There is a lot I would like to show you today, Warden Dawson began, but Carter raised a hand, halting the warden mid-sentence. Before you get rambling, why are we in a school and not a prison? Carter interjected, his tone sharp with curiosity. Well, Sergeant, the prison is completely overrun, and we're not slated to clear it until next week, Warden Dawson explained matter-of-factly. You have the manpower, so what's the holdup? Carter pressed. It's taking some time to develop the men into a formidable fighting force that can work together, which is going to be essential to clearing it, Warden Dawson elaborated. I'm sorry, let's back up a second, Carter interjected once more, cutting off Warden Dawson. You're training your prisoners to fight together as a single unit? Yes, I am, Sergeant. We still have a lot of dangerous sites to clear out, and if they're going to survive, they're going to need to learn to work together, Warden Dawson affirmed. Warden, how many prisoners do you have here, Carter asked. 450, Dawson responded. Carter shook his head in disbelief, the effects of his hangover exacerbating his frustration. So, roughly half of the manpower we have in Spokane. Dawson hesitated, clearly caught off guard before responding, Well, I yes, but we have them under control. You have them under control until you don't. At which point, they're no longer the prisoners, they're the superior force, Carter pointed out bluntly. The last warden treated them like subhumans, Dawson explained defensively. And how'd that work out for him? Carter countered sharply. He's buried in a shallow grave with 37 stab wounds. So I thought I would try a different approach, Dawson admitted grimly. Carter mulled over the information, but his mind was preoccupied with the militia. Okay, Warden, I'm going to level with you. I really don't give two shits about what you're doing up here, as I have much more important matters to attend to. Can you bottom line it for me? What would you like me to tell Captain Page? Carter asked, cutting to the chase. I want her to know that we're ahead of schedule with the clearing operation, and that my ideas are the driving force behind the progress, Warden Dawson replied, seizing the opportunity presented. And there it is. Someone is angling for a promotion? Carter remarked with a knowing smile. Look around, Sergeant. I'm stuck in a high school surrounded by a sea of orange. I'd strangle my own mother if it got me out of here, Dawson confessed with a wry grin. Carter chuckled, giving the warden a reassuring pat on the back. I understand, Dawson, and I got your back. You can count on that. Extending his hand, Carter shook Dawson's before turning to leave. Now, I have things to do, but I'll give you a glowing report when I see the captain in a few minutes. Thank you, Sergeant. Dawson replied gratefully, a broad smile spreading across his face as Carter walked away. As Carter strode off, his demeanor turned serious, his focus squarely on the real job ahead, dealing with the militia. Chapter 2 As the squad arrived at Central Command, the bustling hub of activity greeted them, soldiers and civilians alike engrossed in their respective duties. Exiting the vehicle, they congregated in a unified group before the imposing edifice. Okay, so Armstrong went over everything, right? Queried Sergeant Carter, casting a glance at his men, who affirmed with nods. We've done a lot of important work over the last couple of months, but what we're about to do now is by far the most important. But we don't get out of the starting gate unless we're on the same page, he asserted. Sarge, we all want the same thing. These people are taking from us, and we aim to put a stop to it. If the higher-ups are too blind or stupid to see that we're at war, we'll open their eyes, declared Private Summers, his conviction resonating with the others. 
Carter surveyed his comrades, finding unanimous agreement, and responded with a resolute nod. I appreciate each and every one of you boys more than you know, he expressed sincerely. We got thrown into the fire and you pulled us out multiple times, Sarge. We got your back, assured Private Yang. Okay, let's go get this mission then, concluded Sergeant Carter. The group proceeded into the command center, their footsteps echoing through the corridor. Upon crossing the threshold, a soldier wielding a clipboard signaled for their attention. What's your business here? The soldier inquired. I'm Sergeant Carter. We're here to see Captain Page. She's expecting us, replied Carter with authority. The soldier acknowledged with a nod, then turned aside to converse discreetly into a small communication device. After a brief pause, during which he listened intently, he rejoined the group. Conference room C. Up on the third floor, he directed. I know where that is, interjected Corporal Armstrong confidently. Thank you, soldier, acknowledged Sergeant Carter. The young man nodded as the group strode purposefully through the bustling command center. Oblivious to the flurry of activity around them, their minds were singularly focused on the mission ahead. Ascending to the third floor, they located the conference room. It stood prominently amidst the corridor, its glass walls offering a glimpse of the solitary figure within. Captain Page, a middle-aged blonde woman, appeared visibly strained as she shuffled through documents, her gaze fixed upon them with a hint of desperation. Armstrong rapped on the glass door, drawing her attention. Startled, she glanced up and then motioned them inside. Corporal Armstrong, good to see you again, although I wasn't expecting you until later this afternoon. I was under the impression you were going to inspect the prison camp, remarked Captain Page. We did, Captain, affirmed Corporal Armstrong. Page glanced up from the clutter of documents strewn across her desk, her expression piqued with interest. Oh, really? You ran through the inspection that fast? So tell me, what is your team's report? Captain Page inquired, her gaze shifting to Armstrong, who deferred to Carter. Carter stepped forward projecting an air of authority. Captain, I led the inspection myself, spending time with Warden Dawson. He was on top of everything at the camp, commanded the respect of the prisoners and guards alike, and was on schedule to complete the prison clearing. It's good to know that he has the respect of the prisoners. I know that the last warden wasn't so fortunate. What's his secret? Page inquired further. I could bore you with a bunch of details, Captain, but we both know there's a lot to get done today, so I'll sum it up succinctly. He treats the prisoners like human beings and gives them a fighting chance at survival, Carter responded. Based on what you saw at the school where they're holding them, do you have any concerns about them breaking out? Page inquired, her tone serious. It's secure enough. And I feel confident that the warden has won over enough of the prisoners who have spent enough time there to remember the previous warden. If any of the newcomers tries to get out of line, they'd have to deal with more than just the guards, Carter reassured her. Okay, Sergeant. One more question. If you were in my shoes, what would you do with him? Page asked. Captain? Carter queried, unsure of where she was leading. You're wanting to go investigate the hijacking of our convoy, essentially being the voice of the military out there. So I want to know what you would do with the warden. Because he's put in a transfer request, Page clarified, her gaze fixed on Carter, awaiting his response. Carter stood poised, his demeanor reflective as he carefully deliberated his response. I think he's a very capable officer, doing a lot with very little under difficult circumstances. He's also doing it in a respectable manner, which can be difficult to find these days. While I think he would be an asset on a larger project in Seattle, I think keeping him in his current position would be the best course of action. However, I would boost his rations and send over some vice items, Carter articulated, his words measured. The captain arched an eyebrow, her curiosity evident. Vice items? You want me to send him some booze? Maybe a couple of nudie magazines? Really, Sergeant? A couple bottles of scotch can go a long way, Captain. He wants to move up and most likely deserves to. But the sad reality is, he's a victim of his own success, not only surviving, but thriving in a job that killed the previous occupant of the position. Giving him some perks lets him know that you see the work that he's doing and that you're appreciative of it but sometimes we have to sacrifice what we want in life for the greater good, 
Carter explained earnestly. Page leaned back, assessing Carter with a discerning gaze before nodding. That's an interesting perspective, Sergeant. I will take that under advisement. And don't think for a moment I didn't notice your greater good comment, Page added, her tone suggestive. It's how I feel, Captain. It's how I felt in the first days of this when my entire squad were victims of the virus. I knew what I was capable of, and having four newborns who didn't even finish basic dropped in my lap would limit my effectiveness right out of the gate. But I knew it was for the greater good, and not only did I keep all four of them alive, but I've turned them into a force to be reckoned with, Carter said. In all that training with your men, did you find the time to teach them restraint? Because that's what this mission requires, Paige queried, her tone serious. Absolutely, Captain. While I haven't received a full briefing yet, it doesn't take a genius to know that tensions are running high, and one wrong move could set off a powder keg, Carter affirmed. That is an understatement, Sergeant, Page said. Captain Page gestured for the group to take their seats around the table, then retrieved a folder and tossed it to them. How familiar are you with the Spokane region? She inquired, her tone serious. I know that once you get out of civilization it gets into the wilderness real quick, Sergeant Carter responded. That it does, Sergeant. And somewhere out there in that vast wilderness is the group that hit our convoy, Page affirmed. Now we know their forces stretch from here, all the way down and over to Bend, Oregon. But we're confident that the group that hit the final truck was local, Page continued. How can you be sure, Captain? Corporal Armstrong questioned. First-hand reports. The convoy was first attacked 20 miles outside of Boise, and the attacks kept coming all the way up here. Traps were laid, ambushes, you name it. So part of it is assumption. The other part is that one of the survivors talked to one of the people responsible for the attack, Page explained. They talked to one of the militia members and lived. Are we sure they're not in on it? Carter interjected. We're very positive, Sergeant. He was a teenager from Boise's family was killed because of the militia. He would have been the last person on their side, Page reassured him. Okay, what did they find out? Carter pressed. That it's not just the militia that's attacking us, Page revealed. The soldiers exchanged bewildered glances, uncertainty lingering in the air. If it's not all militia, then who is attacking us? Sergeant Carter questioned. Some of the locals said that they had attacked our convoy at the request of the militia. They said something about returning the favor. They had gotten into a sticky situation with zombies, and the militia helped them out, Captain Page said. So what's our mission? Carter inquired. Your mission, Sergeant, is to head down the road to Rosalia and just see what you can see, Page responded. That's it? Just see what we can see? Carter echoed, his skepticism evident. That's it. There is to be no engagement with the civilian population. Before we do that, we want information on the town, the comings and goings. If they're really being helped by the militia, it would be nice to get some information on their numbers, Page elaborated. So it's a stakeout, Carter said. More or less, Sergeant. At least for the first couple of days. If nothing has happened in 48 hours, we can reevaluate and come up with ideas on how to force the issue, Page confirmed. Though Carter's anger simmered beneath the surface, he forced a smile and nodded in acknowledgement. You got it, Captain. We will be back in 48 hours with a full report. Captain Page observed Sergeant Carter's demeanor with a hint of perplexity. You seem strangely okay with my orders, Sergeant. I would have expected at least some verbal pushback, she remarked. My men and I aren't fond of running headfirst into a blind situation especially one where there are guns aplenty on both sides. Caution is the best course of action, Carter explained. Okay then. My assistant will help you out with supplies. The prison detail managed to find some houses with decent ammunition stocks, so you'll have a light load out, just in case, Page said. Thank you, Captain, Carter acknowledged gratefully. As the group rose from the table, Captain Page nodded at Sergeant Carter before they departed. Outside, they were immediately greeted by her assistant. Hello, Sergeant. The captain gave me your equipment needs. I'm afraid I have to run a few doors down to grab them. If you're parked in the front lot, I will bring them to you shortly, the assistant informed them. Thank you. 
We will be waiting, Carter replied. Carter led his men out of the building in silence, their footsteps echoing down the empty corridor. They reached their vehicles, ensuring they were alone and out of earshot before speaking. I gotta say, Carter, that was some next-level bullshit you were shoveling in there. Frankly, I'm surprised you didn't throw your back out with how fast you were shoveling, Corporal Armstrong remarked. I said what I needed to say in order to secure the mission, Carter replied evenly. And that was quite the glowing review of the warden. Hell of a revision of your first draft where you called him an inept douchebag that was going to get a lot of soldiers killed, Private Hoffman chimed in. Well, Private, if you listen closely to me in there, you would know that I said one thing that was 100% true, Carter responded. And that was? Hoffman inquired. That sometimes you have to do things for the greater good. Sometimes that means keeping an inept man in command. Sometimes that means lying your ass off. And sometimes it means taking the fight to the enemy, even when the higher-ranking officers refuse to, Carter explained. Carter extended his fist, prompting everyone to join him in a circle, putting their fists together. For our fallen comrades. We will get them justice, he declared solemnly. Carter locked eyes with each of his men, seeing the same resolve reflected in their expressions. With a nod, he broke ranks, knowing they were all prepared to do what they deemed necessary. Chapter 3 Sergeant Carter sat in the passenger seat of the lead SUV in a two-vehicle convoy, his gaze fixed on the wilderness beyond his sunglasses as Private Clayton navigated the road ahead. The journey from Spokane had been marked by Carter's intense focus, bordering on a trance-like state, a silence that began to weigh on Clayton's mind. Are you okay over there, Sarge? Clayton broke the silence. I'm perfect, Clayton. Why do you ask? Carter responded without shifting his gaze. You've just been very quiet. That's all, Clayton explained. I'm just mentally preparing for what's to come, Carter replied somberly. This is going to be a difficult day, even if everything goes perfectly, which it won't. People are going to die, and we are going to be the ones who take their lives from them. And while I'd like to believe everyone we snuff out deserved it, I know that's not going to be the case, because it's never the case. Clayton's unease became palpable, catching Carter's attention. Have you ever killed a man, Clayton? Carter's voice carried a weight of experience. No, Sarge, I haven't. I don't think I've ever aimed my weapon at a man, at least one who was still alive, Clayton admitted. The first time is the hardest, but them aiming back at you makes breaking the ice a little easier. Carter offered a grim reassurance. When the time comes, Sarge, I'll be ready to do what needs to be done, Clayton affirmed. I know you will, Clayton, and I can't thank you enough for being here by my side, Carter said. You're the reason I'm still alive, so I'm with you, Clayton said. That's good to know, Clayton, because we are the tip of the spear. We are at war, even if those in charge don't realize it. By the time today ends, they're going to know it, and we're going to be the ones to open their eyes to it, Carter replied. Because they're insulated from reality. Most of them never leave their little offices, never face what we face. Our brothers were cut down by an enemy force, and today, we strike back, Carter explained. Clayton began nodding in agreement with Carter, who continued staring out the window, his gaze fixed on distant trees, his mind devoid of thoughts as he readied himself. After several more minutes of driving, Clayton slowed down, pulling off the side of the road. We're a couple miles away from town, Sarge, Private Clayton announced. Perfect, Sergeant Carter replied. Everyone exited the vehicles, assembling at the rear of the lead SUV. While Carter addressed the men, Hoffman and Yang opened up the back of the lead vehicle, retrieving weapons and ammunition for distribution. Corporal Armstrong stepped forward, retrieving a sniper rifle from the back, checking the ammunition before slinging it over his shoulder. Our mission today is twofold, Sergeant Carter declared. The first is to find the people in this town who are directly responsible for the deaths of our comrades. The other is to draw out the militia in the region. If the civilians in this town were willing to kill for the militia, it's certain they're still in touch with them. So what's the plan, Sarge? Corporal Armstrong inquired. I want you to find a position overlooking the edge of town, Carter directed. We're going in with two teams, and we're going in hard. 
Clayton and I will strike first, drawing their attention and holding up at the first building inside town. Yang, Summers, and Hoffman will circle around to the rear of town, moving up to strike when the time is right. All of the men gave a nod as Carter continued speaking. There will be civilians in the mix, and going in hot will give them a chance to move the vulnerable away from the fight. However, if someone is holding a gun, they're fair game. But nobody is to open up on them until I give the signal. We can wipe them out without trouble, but we need them to call for the militia. Is that understood? Carter clarified. Everybody responded with a solid nod, prompting Carter to smile. Okay, you know your missions. Let's get it done. Radio when you're in position, he concluded. Come on, Corporal, we'll give you a lift. We're taking the long way around, Private Yang suggested to Corporal Armstrong. The others got into their vehicle, immediately driving off the road towards a country road off in the distance. As they waited, Carter and Clayton stood there, mostly in silence. Carter could tell that the private was getting nervous about the situation. Just relax, private. You're going to be okay, Carter reassured him. It's not that, Sarge. I'm ready for the fight. I'm just concerned with what the fallout is going to be. I've seen what the prison squad has to deal with, Clayton admitted. There's not going to be any prison detail for us, especially since we're the ones who are attacked first. At least that's what's going to be on my report, Carter assured him. Do you think they'll buy it? Clayton asked. They're not going to have any choice but to, private, Carter replied firmly. They're going to be dealing with the reality that we're at war, and they're not going to risk more men to come down and investigate, he added. So there really is no peaceful way to deal with the situation. Clayton questioned. There was until the militia killed our brothers. Killed my friend in cold blood. They could have just let them pass, but they've made their bed. We're just here to tuck them into it, Carter said with conviction. Clayton nodded as the two of them fell silent, focusing on checking their weapons and gear. Several minutes passed before Corporal Armstrong radioed in. Sarge, do you copy? Armstrong's voice crackled through the radio. I'm here, Armstrong. What do you have? Sergeant Carter responded promptly. They have a heavy-duty barricade on the highway, just at the edge of town. But from what I can see, there's only two guards, Armstrong reported. What about a place for us to hold up? Carter inquired. As soon as you get past the barricade, there's a two-story house about 50 yards away to the right. Empty field behind it, neighborhood in front, with some businesses across the way, Armstrong detailed. Do you have a clean line of sight? Carter asked. I can cover the entire front yard and into the neighborhood. Can't see the front of the stores, but if someone tries to get up top, they won't be coming back down again, Armstrong assured. Good. Clayton and I are on the move, Carter stated decisively. Go get after them, Sergeant Armstrong encouraged before the line went dead as Carter walked towards the driver's seat of the SUV. I want you in the back, Clayton. That way you can fire out both sides if you need to, Carter instructed as they prepared to move. You got it, Sarge, Clayton affirmed. The two of them settled into their positions, Carter placing his handgun on his lap. As he started the vehicle, he spoke quietly to himself. I hope you're resting easy, Alvarez. I'm going to get justice for you, old friend, Carter murmured. After finishing his silent conversation with the departed, he put the SUV into gear and began driving down the highway. In the distance, the outline of Rosalia loomed on the horizon. Approaching the barricade, they observed its imposing presence, with only a narrow opening in the middle for a vehicle to pass through. Behind it sat another car, as if awaiting its turn to reinforce the blockade. Drawing nearer, they spotted two guards armed with hunting rifles, standing up and waving in their direction. Okay, here we go, Clayton. Do not make a move unless I do or unless they fire at us, Carter instructed. You got it, Sarge, Clayton acknowledged. Carter guided the SUV to a halt just outside the narrow opening of the barricade, where both guards, middle-aged men, awaited them. One stood directly beside the vehicle, while the other remained behind the blockade, about ten yards away from his companion. Welcome to Rosalia, can we help you, stranger? The guard nearest to them greeted. 
Carter swiftly raised his handgun, resting it on the windowsill, aiming directly at the closer guard. Yes, I was wondering if you could give me some information. Some friends of mine rolled through town a few days ago, and they told me that you not only shot at them, but killed some of them too. I was kind of hoping you could point me in the direction of the people who did it, Carter inquired. The guard with the gun on him immediately dropped his rifle, raising his hands in surrender. His partner, however, hesitated, his grip tightening on his own rifle, as if considering his next move. Carter noticed the subtle shift in his demeanor. I would really recommend against doing what you're thinking about doing, Carter cautioned, his voice carrying a weight of warning. Carter maintained his unwavering gaze as the guard decided to take his chances. With a swift motion, the guard raised his rifle, poised to fire. Reacting with trained precision, Carter adjusted his aim and fired a single round from his handgun. The bullet tore through the man's chest, felling him instantly. Without missing a beat, Carter swiftly redirected his focus to the remaining guard, who stood frozen in terror. So as I was saying, I'm looking for the people who killed my friend. I don't suppose it was you, was it? Carter inquired, his tone calm but authoritative. The guard vehemently shook his head, stammering in his response. No, sir, I swear, I didn't. I was back with the women and children, keeping an eye on them, the guard explained, his voice trembling with fear. That's very noble of you. But you know who did it, don't you? Carter pressed, a faint smile playing at the corners of his lips. The guard nodded slightly, prompting a nod of satisfaction from Carter. Good. Would you mind getting them on the line? Let them know that I'd like to have a word with them, Carter requested, his tone firm but not unkind. The guard, still visibly shaken, pointed towards the barricade, struggling to articulate his words. Use your words now. I'm not a mind reader, Carter reminded him. The radio, it's over by the car there, the guard managed to convey, his fear palpable. Okay, move slow. And remember what happened to your friend there when he decided to try and play the hero, Carter cautioned. I'm not going to try anything, I swear. I have a wife and a baby at home, and all I want to do is see them again, the guard pleaded. Then I suggest that after you make the call, you go home to them, Carter advised. The guard, still trembling with fear, moved towards the radio and picked it up. Mike, do you copy? Please, for the love of God, do you copy? He pleaded urgently. A moment later, the line crackled to life. I heard a gunshot. Is everything okay? Mike said. No, there's a man here who really wants to talk to you. Says you killed his friend, the guard relayed. There followed a long silence on the line, which Carter could hear. Mr. Guard, sir, Carter prompted, breaking the silence. Whenever he finds his voice again, just let him know that we'll be waiting for him in the house over there. Carter gestured towards the target house, prompting the guard to give a slight nod. He watched in confused horror as Sergeant Carter drove over to the side of the house, Clayton accompanying him. The two men exited the vehicle and casually made their way inside, as if they owned the place. Mike, you need to get down here right now. Chapter 4 Carter and Clayton entered the house nestled on the outskirts of town. With precision, Clayton swiftly swept through the rooms to ensure they were empty, while Carter nonchalantly shut the door behind them, securing it with a decisive click of the lock. Moments later, Clayton descended the staircase with urgency. The house is clear, Sarge, Clayton reported promptly. Good. Make sure you establish a solid firing position from the second floor overlooking the front, Carter instructed. Then keep watch over the rear. Can't be too careful. I doubt they'll be foolish enough to attempt a raid, but you never know. I'm on it, Clayton affirmed before darting off to carry out his orders. As Clayton hurried away, Carter reached for the walkie-talkie, his focus unwavering. Armstrong, do you copy? He radioed. I'm here, Sarge. Looks like you kicked up the hornet's nest. Corporal Armstrong responded promptly. Peering out the front window, Carter scanned the surroundings but saw no immediate movement. What do you see, Corporal? Carter inquired, his eyes still fixed on the scene outside. A couple of trucks pulled up a few blocks down from you towards the neighborhood. 
and there's several men standing behind the stores, trying to get organized. Armstrong relayed. How many are we looking at? Carter asked. 10 to 15, Armstrong reported. We can handle that. Carter asserted confidently. Hoffman, are you there? We're here on the south side, Sarge, waiting for your signal. Private Hoffman responded over the radio. Any activity on your end? Carter inquired. A bit. They've brought in some reinforcements for the guards at the southern barricade, but nothing we can't handle, Hoffman reported calmly. All right, hold tight and await my command, Carter instructed. Carter stowed away the walkie-talkie, returning to the window to observe the street below with keen interest. After several minutes of vigilant watch, he noticed movement across the street, evidenced by the shifting of curtains in nearby houses as the shooters positioned themselves. They're smart, at least. Perhaps the militia has been offering them some advice. But it won't make a difference, Carter remarked confidently to himself, his gaze fixed on the unfolding scene outside. Moments later, a truck began to inch its way down the street, the driver keeping low to evade potential gunfire. Several armed men accompanied the vehicle, their weapons trained on the house. Looks like it's just about show time, Carter muttered under his breath, his grip tightening on his rifle as he prepared for what was to come. Peering cautiously out of the window, Carter surveyed the situation. Suddenly, a voice rang out from behind the truck, addressing him. You in the house, can you hear me? The voice called. I can hear you just fine, Carter responded calmly. My name is Mike, and I speak for the town, the voice continued. I don't know what you want, but we have no further wish for bloodshed. We're just civilians trying to ride this out. We don't want to fight with anybody. Really? So what brought on the change of heart? Carter challenged. I don't know what you're talking about, Mike replied, his voice betraying a hint of unease. Surely you do, Mike. Surely you remember my friend, Sergeant Alvarez, don't you? Carter's words hung in the air. Carter peered intently through the window, observing the visible distress etched on Mike's face. There it is. That's what I was looking for. Carter yelled out, pausing to put the pressure on Mike. Tell me, Mike, were you the one who pulled the trigger? Carter's continued. Mike hesitated, his gaze faltering for a moment before he spoke again. To be honest, I'm not sure who pulled the trigger. There were lots of bullets flying in both directions. I was there, though. I even spoke to him before he passed. He went peacefully, if that matters. Carter felt a surge of conflicting emotions wash over him grief, anger, and a deep-seated desire for justice, but he swiftly pushed them aside to maintain his composure. While it does bring me some peace to know he didn't suffer, it doesn't change anything, Carter responded, his tone steady but tinged with sadness. I figured that it wouldn't. So how does this end? Mike replied. You declared war on the U.S. military, Mike. You took things that didn't belong to you and killed some of our men. How do you think this is going to end? Carter said. I can't give you what I don't have. Whatever was in that caravan is long gone from here, taken by others, Mike admitted. Sending us in the right direction would be a good start, Carter suggested. I wish I could, but I can't. They didn't tell us where they were headed, and we didn't ask, Mike confessed. That's a shame, Mike, because that just might have saved the people in your town, Carter replied. Carter watched from the window, observing Mike's increasing nervousness and the heated exchange he was having with the individuals behind the truck. Despite being unable to hear their words, Carter could sense the tension mounting until, finally, Mike seemed to prevail in the debate. I want to make a deal with you, Mike's voice, tinged with desperation, cut through the air. I'm sure you do, Carter responded dryly. If I give myself up, go with you to face justice, will that be enough to save my town? These are just hard-working folks trying to survive. They didn't ask for any of this, Mike pleaded. Carter considered the proposal for a moment before offering his response. I tell you what, Mike, come on out from your hiding spot. Make your way towards the house and apologize, because Sergeant Alvarez, he was my friend, and you took him from me and this world. Nodding to the others beside the truck, Mike handed them his hunting rifle before cautiously emerging and slowly advancing towards the house, his hands raised in surrender trembling with fear. 
As Mike reached the midpoint between the truck and the house, Carter called out to him. That's far enough, Mike. Now apologize. I'm so sorry, sir. If I had to do it over again, I would never ask for the malicious help. We would have figured out a way, and if we had, then your friend would still be alive. I'm sorry for ending your friend's life. I really am. Mike's voice quivered with genuine remorse. You know, Mike, I'd like to believe you, but those tears rolling down your face don't seem genuine, Carter remarked. I swear they are, sir. I'm so sorry for killing your friend, Mike pleaded earnestly. Sorry, Mike, I'm still not buying the tears. But I know one way to make sure that they're real, Carter declared. A hushed stillness settled over the scene, interrupted only by the whisper of the wind. Then, with abrupt brutality, a sniper's bullet tore through the air, finding its mark in the side of Mike's knee. The impact was devastating, nearly severing the lower portion of his leg and sending him crashing to the ground in agonizing torment. His anguished scream pierced the air, a raw expression of pain and despair. In an instant, chaos erupted. A barrage of gunfire erupted from outside, bullets shredding through the wooden walls of the house as if they were paper. Sergeant Carter swiftly dropped to a knee beside the front door, his back pressed against the sturdy frame as wood splintered and glass shattered around him. Amidst the onslaught, Carter's voice cut through the cacophony, sharp and commanding. Hit them hard, Clayton. Private Clayton swiftly maneuvered his rifle through the upstairs window, leveraging his advantageous position to target the adversaries clustered around the truck. With precision aim, he unleashed a barrage of gunfire, his shots finding their marks with deadly accuracy. The assailant's feeble cover offered little defense against Clayton's relentless assault from above. A sharp crack echoed through the air as one of the men was struck square in the chest, his body crumpling to the ground in a motionless heap. Sensing the urgency of the situation, his companion abandoned his weapon, hastily moving to assist his fallen comrade. He grasped the wounded man and began dragging him towards the shelter of a nearby house, seeking refuge from the relentless barrage. Undeterred, Clayton continued his onslaught, firing at the retreating figures. His shots found their marks with lethal precision, sending a hail of bullets raining down around them. A sharp cry of pain pierced the air as one of Clayton's shots struck the fleeing man in the back of the leg, sending him sprawling to the ground in agonizing torment. Clayton maintained his watchful gaze as the wounded man struggled to his feet, determination etched on his face as he stubbornly dragged his injured comrade to safety. Despite his own injuries, he refused to abandon his friend, his singular focus on getting him to safety evident in every strained movement. Meanwhile, Sergeant Carter wasted no time, seizing the opportunity to retaliate against the enemy across the street. Steadying his aim, he protruded his rifle through the shattered remnants of a window in the front room, taking careful aim at his target. With deadly accuracy, he unleashed a barrage of gunfire, the sound of each shot reverberating through the tense air. A splatter of blood painted the inside of the shattered window, a grim testament to the efficacy of his aim. Quickly ducking back behind cover as enemy shots peppered the front of the house, Carter maintained his vigilance, his senses on high alert for any sign of danger. Upstairs, Clayton continued to rain down fire upon the enemy, his shots ringing out in rapid succession. However, the firefight intensified as enemy bullets found their mark, sending Clayton scrambling for cover, his heart pounding with adrenaline-fueled urgency. Bullets tore through the window where Clayton had been firing just moments before, the close call sending him sprawling to the floor. With adrenaline coursing through his veins, he quickly scrambled across the bedroom floor, seeking refuge behind the relative safety of the door. I better check the rear, Clayton muttered to himself. Pulling himself upright, he moved swiftly but cautiously, keeping low as he navigated the hallway to reach the opposite side of the house. Peering out of the windows, he was met with the sight of three armed men advancing from behind the building. Reacting swiftly, Clayton flung open the window, his training kicking in as he took aim and unleashed a rapid succession of shots. While his accuracy faltered under the pressure of the moment, a few stray bullets found their marks, striking the lead man in the advancing group and momentarily halting their advance towards the house. As Clayton dropped back into cover, one of the remaining assailants returned fire, while the other swiftly seized their fallen comrade and dragged them towards the shelter of a nearby tree. Undeterred, Clayton swiftly reemerged from cover, unleashing a few more shots in their direction to ensure they continued their retreat. With the immediate threat temporarily repelled, 
Clayton reached for his walkie-talkie, his voice urgent as he relayed the situation to Sergeant Carter. Sarge, we had some guys try and sneak up on us, but I drove them back. Clayton reported tersely. Good, stay at your position. I have things under control at the front of the house, Carter responded. Meanwhile, Carter surveyed the scene outside the front window, noting the several poorly armed adversaries as they dug in for what promised to be a protracted battle. Carter brought the radio back to his lips. Armstrong, what do you have for me? He inquired, his tone clipped and commanding. Two guys up on the roof, setting up a little sniper's nest, Corporal Armstrong replied promptly. Hit one. Make sure they know what direction it came from. I want to put the fear of God into these assholes. Let them know that there's no way out unless they call for help, Carter ordered. You got it, Sarge, Armstrong acknowledged before signing off. Armstrong steadied his aim, his focus unwavering, as he observed the two men positioned on the roof. One of them lay prone, his hunting rifle aimed menacingly towards the house, while the other remained on one knee, adjusting his weapon. Looks like you're the winner, Armstrong remarked dryly. Taking careful aim, Armstrong targeted the more exposed of the two men, his finger tightening on the trigger. The gunshot rang out, the bullet finding its mark with lethal precision, tearing through the back of the man's shoulder and sending him tumbling over the edge of the store. Blood splattered onto his companion as he plummeted to the street below, the force of the shot pulling him off balance. For a fleeting moment, the surviving gunman remained frozen in confusion, struggling to comprehend the sudden turn of events. With a sense of urgency, he scanned the surrounding area, his gaze darting towards Armstrong's direction in search of the source of the shot. Unable to pinpoint its origin, he wasted no time in making a decision. Rather than risk further confrontation, the man swiftly swung his legs over the front edge of the store, bracing himself as he dangled precariously before dropping to the street below. That had to hurt like hell. I mean, you made the right choice, but damn, that's some commitment, Armstrong remarked, a hint of admiration mingling with his words as he watched the daring escape unfold. Armstrong raised the radio to his lips once more, his eyes fixed through the scope as he observed the chaos unfolding below. Hey Sarge, it looks like I got their attention, he reported. Good work, Armstrong, Carter responded. As Carter surveyed the scene outside the window, he turned to Armstrong for his assessment. What do you think, Corporal? Have we caused enough trouble to get them to call the militia in yet? Carter inquired. I don't know, Sarge. Couldn't hurt to make sure. They're the ones who wanted to fight after all, Armstrong replied. I like the way you think. Hoffman, are you on the line? Carter called out over the radio. We're right here, Sarge. Private Hoffman's voice crackled over the radio. How's it looking over there? Carter inquired. I'm pretty sure the guards at the barricade are wetting themselves, Hoffman reported with a hint of amusement. And you guys? Carter pressed further. Trying not to take it personally that you're leaving us out of the festivities, Hoffman responded wryly. Consider the invitation extended. Hit them hard and drive them away from the house, Carter commanded decisively. With the orders given, Hoffman relayed the instructions to his comrades, rallying them for the upcoming assault. Okay, boys, we're up. Let's go put a hurting on them, Hoffman declared, a hint of excitement ringing in his voice as they prepared to join the fray. Chapter 5 Hoffman assumed his position behind the wheel of the SUV, his handgun resting in his lap, while Yang and Summers stationed themselves near the open windows and sunroof, poised for action. The trio remained on high alert, waiting for the opportune moment to make their move. Are you two ready? Private Hoffman inquired, his gaze shifting between his companions. Yes, they both replied in unison, evoking a satisfied grin from Hoffman. Okay, let's get into the fight then, he declared. With a firm press on the gas pedal, Hoffman propelled the vehicle forward, its powerful engine sending them out from behind their tree-lined cover and onto the road leading to town. As they approached the barricade, adrenaline coursed through their veins, anticipation mingling with the roar of the engine. Closing in on their target, the guards manning the barricade assumed firing positions, rifles trained on the approaching SUV. Bullets began flying, accompanied by the sound of gunfire echoing through the air. 
Despite the barrage, most shots veered off course, narrowly missing their intended target. A bullet shattered the front windshield, whizzing perilously close to the occupants before exiting through the rear window, which only served to anger Hoffman. Light them up, Private Hoffman commanded. Yang rose from his position in the sunroof, unleashing a barrage of gunfire towards the barricade. Though his shots lacked precision at such a distance and speed, their impact was enough to force the guards to seek cover, granting them a momentary advantage. Hang on, Hoffman shouted. Hoffman guided the SUV towards the barricade, executing a sharp turn as he pulled the handbrake, sending the vehicle skidding sideways to a halt mere yards away from their adversaries. Meanwhile, Yang maintained his relentless assault, targeting the oldest of the guards positioned to his left. With precise aim, he dispatched the man with a couple of well-placed shots, causing him to crumple to the ground. Summers, positioned at the rear window, joined in the fray, swiftly neutralizing another threat with a lethal shot to the head before the man could retaliate. Yang, undeterred, continued his onslaught, unleashing a barrage of bullets into another guard's chest, swiftly ending his life. With a calculated turn of his gun, he trained his sights on the remaining guard. A man in his thirties, who faced with imminent danger, dropped his weapon and raised his hands in surrender. Please don't shoot. Don't kill me. Don't kill me, the man pleaded. Yang held his rifle steady, his gaze unwavering as he sought guidance from Hoffman. What do you think, Hoffman? Are we taking prisoners today? He inquired. Hoffman's response was resolute. Did they show our people any quarter when they had the chance? He countered, his voice heavy with conviction. No, Hoffman, I don't believe they did, Yang admitted grimly. Well, there's your answer, Yang, Hoffman declared. Private Yang turned to the man, who had his hands high in the air, a terrified look on his face. In your next life, remember not to fuck with the military, Private Yang uttered sternly. Yang fired a single shot that ripped through the man's chest, dropping him to the ground. As he got back into the vehicle, the other two men were focused, almost excited that the fighting had begun. Tip of the spear, boys. Come on, let's go get some justice for our brothers, Private Hoffman declared. Hoffman hit the gas, picking up speed towards the house on the other side of town. As they went, they could see civilians piled into stores, staying low, with terrified looks on their faces. Keep your eyes open, Summers. They look like innocents, but one of them might not be, cautioned Private Yang. If anybody so much as points a finger gun at us, they're getting a bullet, responded Private Summers. As they approached the northern side of town, the distant echo of gunshots reverberated through the air, punctuating the otherwise still atmosphere. Hoffman navigated down a residential road, coming to a halt midway with everyone swiftly exiting the vehicle. In an instant, they assumed defensive positions, their weapons poised and alert eyes scanning the surroundings for any potential threats. Once they pinpointed the origin of the gunfire, they turned northward, methodically maneuvering through the neighborhood. They remained a few blocks away from the ongoing skirmish, swiftly traversing through the yards. Despite their focus on the path ahead, they remained vigilant, casting wary glances towards the windows of passing houses. Either there's nobody home, or they're too scared to take a shot at us, Private Hoffman remarked. I don't care which it is. As long as they're smart enough to stay out of our way, Private Summers retorted. The trio approached the battleground, halting at the house adjacent to the row where Sergeant Carter positioned himself. Hoffman motioned for them to take a knee, surveying the unfolding scene before them. The conflict primarily centered around three adjacent houses, including the one directly opposite Carter's position and the ones flanking it. In the rear of the middle house, they observed two individuals writhing in agony on the ground, while others attended to their injuries. Yang instinctively raised his rifle, but Hoffman swiftly intervened, gently pushing it down before speaking in hushed tones. Give it a minute. Let's see if they move them, Private Hoffman advised, his voice barely above a whisper. Yang acknowledged with a nod, and they maintained their surveillance. As anticipated, a pickup truck rumbled through the yards, maneuvering to the wounded individuals. Swiftly, they were loaded into the vehicle before the occupants jumped in, speeding off towards the west side of town. Hoffman gestured for Yang and Summers to follow as they advanced towards the rear of the central house. 
Arriving at the back door, they slid it open before cautiously entering. Gunshots echoed from the front room and upstairs. Using hand signals, Hoffman directed the others to ascend the stairs while he tackled the threat on the ground floor. Yang and Summers nodded in understanding, swiftly and silently executing their assigned tasks. Meanwhile, Hoffman advanced with his rifle poised, moving stealthily towards the front room where sporadic rifle shots resonated. Within moments, the private positioned himself, aiming his weapon at the back of a middle-aged man stationed by the front window. Hoffman bided his time, waiting for the man to discharge another round and commence reloading. As soon as he discerned the empty chamber, Hoffman emitted a subtle clicking sound, capturing the man's attention. You should really lock the back door, Private Hoffman remarked coolly. Before the man could utter a warning, Hoffman swiftly discharged a single round, piercing through the man's chest. With deliberate restraint, he refrained from firing again, hoping to maintain the illusion of routine gunfire. Remaining poised for a few moments, Hoffman discerned shots echoing from upstairs, though they originated further from the windows. Shortly after, a distinct knocking on the floor signaled clearance from the upper level. Moving to the front window, Hoffman peered towards the house occupied by Carter, then reached for his radio. Hey Sarge, you've got some new neighbors, Private Hoffman said. Hoffman caught sight of Carter peering cautiously from behind the curtains, their eyes briefly locking before a sudden shot forced Carter back into cover. If you could do something about those other gunmen, that would be fantastic, Sergeant Carter said. We're on it, Sarge, Hoffman responded resolutely. Moving swiftly, Hoffman regrouped with Yang and Summers at the rear of the house as they descended the stairs. Come on, let's hit the city side house, Hoffman instructed. The trio nodded in unison before swiftly exiting the house and hastening towards the neighboring building. Repeating their previous tactics, they stealthily infiltrated through the back door and assumed strategic positions on both floors. In a repeat of their previous efficiency, the civilian gunmen remained unaware of their presence until it was too late. Swift and precise shots from unseen assailants incapacitated all three adversaries, leaving no room for retaliation. Hoffman glanced out the front window once more, exchanging a reassuring thumbs up with the sergeant. However, as the group prepared to exit the house and move towards the third target, a sense of unease settled in. The gunfire emanating from the third house had ceased, drawing their attention. Just as they registered the change, three figures emerged from the rear exit. Reacting swiftly, Hoffman raised his rifle and fired, but the shot veered off mark due to the unfamiliar distance. One of the men turned in response, returning fire towards them. The bullet found its mark, striking Yang in the bicep and causing him to collapse to the ground, writhing in pain. Both Hoffman and Summers reacted swiftly, unleashing a barrage of bullets towards the assailants. The gunmen who had wounded Yang absorbed the majority of the gunfire, collapsing to the ground in a crumpled heap. The other two assailants opted not to retaliate, instead choosing to flee. Before Hoffman and Summers could readjust their aim, the civilians darted between a nearby house to the south, disappearing from sight. Should we go after them? Private Summers questioned. No, tend to Yang. I'm going to let the Sarge know we're clear, Hoffman directed. Exiting into the main stretch of road between the houses, Hoffman emitted a sharp whistle. We're good out here, Sarge, he called out. As Sergeant Carter emerged from the house, he surveyed the area before reaching for his radio. I think we're looking good here, Armstrong. But if you see anybody approach our position, shoot first, and if they survive, I'll ask questions later, Carter instructed firmly. Understood, Carter, Armstrong said. Sergeant Carter approached Mike, who had fashioned a makeshift tourniquet using his belt but was still visibly losing blood. Taking a knee beside him, Carter engaged in conversation. Well, that was fun, wasn't it, Mike? Tell me, was it worth it? Did the militia even provide you with any of the bullets you helped take from us? Carter inquired, his tone a mix of casual conversation and interrogation. They didn't give any, and I didn't ask. We just wanted to be left alone, but they were insistent after they helped us, Mike responded, his voice tinged with resignation. And where are they now? In your darkest hour, they're nowhere to be found, Carter remarked pointedly, his tone laced with skepticism. If I had called them as soon as you arrived, they still wouldn't be here, Mike admitted. 
Lucky for you, I have some time to kill. So, I'm going to make you a deal. You have your radio, don't you? Carter asked, gesturing towards Mike's belt. Upon Mike's nod, Carter removed the radio and placed it on Mike's chest. You call someone in your group, tell them to call the militia, and have them come up here. And if you do that, we'll leave the rest of your town alone, provided that they stay in their houses until we leave. Is that a deal that sounds fair to you? Carter proposed. Yeah, I'll do it. Mike agreed reluctantly. Mike winced in pain as he lifted the radio, the intensity of the sniper wound throbbing through his leg. Jimmy, are you there? Mike's voice resonated through the radio. Yeah, I'm here, Mike, Jimmy responded promptly. I need you to listen carefully. You're going to do exactly as I say. And from this moment forward, the only words you say to me is, yes, Mike, do you understand? Mike instructed firmly. Yes, Mike, Jimmy affirmed obediently. Good boy, Jimmy. Now I need you to get our friends on the radio, the ones who helped clean out the school. Do you know who I'm talking about? Mike queried. Yes, Mike, Jimmy replied. Good. Tell them that the bill for those bullets came due and that they need to come to town and settle up, Mike directed. Yes, Mike, Jimmy acknowledged. And then I want you to get everybody back to the bunker houses on the west side of town and stay there until... Mike trailed off, glancing up at Carter for confirmation. Until morning. We'll be long gone by then, Carter interjected. Mike nodded before returning his attention to the radio. You stay there until morning, no matter what you hear. Is that understood? Mike commanded. Yes, Mike, Jimmy confirmed once more. Mike switched off the radio and discarded it aside. Okay, I did what you asked, Mike confirmed. Good man, Mike. You saved a lot of lives today. It's really a shame you didn't save my friend Alvarez's life, Carter remarked solemnly. I'm sorry, Mike replied, his voice heavy with remorse. I'm sure you are, Mike, but let me ask you a question. You said that he went peacefully, Carter inquired. He did, Mike affirmed. May I ask how? Carter pressed on. It was in a town down the road a ways. He sacrificed himself so that someone else could get away, and took a round to the gut in the process. I could see that he was going to bleed out, and there was nothing we could do about it. So I asked if he needed water or anything, Mike recounted. He said no, that he just wanted to sit and enjoy the peace for a few moments. So I did as he asked, Mike continued, his voice tinged with sadness. Sergeant Carter nodded in understanding. That was nice of you, Mike, and I'm going to show you the same kindness that you showed him, Carter declared. Turning to Hoffman, Carter issued instructions. Go in the house and get some water for this man, Carter ordered. Hoffman complied without protest, nodding in acknowledgement. As Hoffman fetched water, Carter grabbed Mike by the shirt, leading him a few yards over to the stairs in front of the house, propping him up. Do you want to die alone, Mike? Carter asked, his voice surprisingly gentle. Truth be told, not really, Mike admitted. Carter nodded as Hoffman returned with bottled water, handing them over to Carter. Thank you, Hoffman. Go secure the perimeter, just in case anybody gets sneaky, Carter instructed. Hoffman nodded and promptly headed off to fulfill his task. Carter opened the water bottle, handing it to Mike. As Mike drank, Carter reached down and undid the belt acting as a tourniquet, causing blood to flow quickly from the leg wound. The sergeant offered a comforting pat on the shoulder, silently reassuring him. Mike let out a deep sigh, taking another long gulp of water before setting it down. Carter sat beside him, drinking his own water, as both men sat in silence as Mike slowly bled out. Chapter 6 At the militia compound to the north of St. Mary's, positioned 50 miles west of Rosalia, the day unfolded much like any other. Half of the men were bustling about in town, lending their hands to the numerous ongoing projects. Within the compound's confines, families of militia members reveled in the sun's warmth, relishing the opportunity to bask outdoors. Children frolicked in games while some spouses observed, engaged in idle chatter. Meanwhile, in the radio room, the atmosphere buzzed with activity as half a dozen men diligently manned the radios. 
these vital communication devices facilitated connections with individuals across the country, as well as coordinated efforts with neighboring militia groups. In his compact radio room, Reed reclined, momentarily unoccupied as the radio remained silent. His feet rested on the desk, a book grasped in his hands, until his tranquility was shattered by a frantic call from Jimmy. Tatum. Tatum. Are you there? Please, are you there? Jimmy yelled. Hang on now, hang on. I need you to calm down, Reed responded. Is this Tatum? Please, I need to talk to Tatum, Jimmy implored desperately. Tatum is occupied at the moment. This is Reed. Why don't you start by telling me who this is? Reed suggested. Reed, you were one of the guys who came down to my town, Rosalia, a few weeks back, weren't you? Jimmy's voice trembled with anxiety. Rosalia? Why does that sound familiar? Reed queried, racking his memory. The horde of those things coming down the highway? The school, do you know what I'm talking about? Jimmy reminded him urgently. Oh, hell. Yeah, the school. Is this Jimmy? Reed responded. Yeah, it is, man. I really need Tatum, Jimmy pleaded. Okay, Jimmy, just calm down and tell me what's going on. I wasn't bullshitting you when I said he was occupied, Reed assured him. They told me to tell you that the bill for the bullets has come due, Jimmy relayed. Reed's mind raced, piecing together the gravity of the situation. Shit, the military is there? How many of them? Reed inquired urgently. There's only a handful of them, and they're pissed off. They've been shooting people all morning, Jimmy divulged. Shooting people. Jesus, is anybody hurt? Reed asked. A lot of people are dead, Reed, and I'm pretty sure Mike is one of them, Jimmy said. Reed's sense of urgency heightened as he sat up, his authoritative demeanor surfacing as he pounded on the door of his cramped quarters. Jesus, okay, Jimmy, are you okay? Are you hiding? Reed pressed. Yeah, I'm okay. The civilians are all fine. They told us to get into the bunker houses at the west side of town and not come out until morning, Jimmy assured him. Okay, that's exactly what I want you to do. You stay in that house and don't come out until they tell you to, Reed instructed firmly, before directing his attention to the door, smacking on it again to get someone's attention. Covering the receiver, Reed issued a command to the militiamen who had appeared at his door. Find Tatum and tell him we have a code red. We need the strike team, and we need it now. Reed's voice carried authority as the man nodded and swiftly departed, leaving Reed to refocus on the call. Okay, Jimmy, we're going to be on the way soon. I want you to sit tight, and we're going to take care of it, Reed reassured. Be careful, Reed, and just be aware. They have a sniper out on the northern edge of town. At least that's where he was when he shot Mike, Jimmy cautioned. Understood. We'll be there soon, Reed said. Reed surged up from his seat, swiftly making his way to the main room of the radio building. His urgency was met by the sudden appearance of his brother Frank, who approached with a mixture of confusion and concern. Reed, what the hell is going on? One of the men just came running by, asking if I knew where Tatum was, Frank exclaimed. Get a map of the area and set up in the meeting room in 10, Reed commanded tersely. Reed, what's going on? Frank pressed. The military is in Rosalia, looking for their pound of flesh, Reed replied grimly. Ten minutes later, Tatum, Eric, Devin, and Edgar hurried into the radio building, their steps purposeful. As they entered, the other militiamen not part of their strike team instinctively retreated, one of them gesturing toward the meeting room. In the meeting room, Frank and Reed were poring over a map of the area, their brows furrowed in concentration. Okay, Reed, what do we know? Tatum inquired as they entered. A small group of military men showed up in Rosalia a couple of hours ago, kicking up a shitstorm. A bunch of people are dead, including Mike most likely, Reed reported. Damn it, Tatum muttered, his head dropping as he processed the news. Oh, it gets better. Apparently they're pissed off about that convoy we helped hijack, Reed added. Tatum's frustration mounted evident in the shake of his head as he grappled with the escalating situation. I told Maxwell that hitting the convoy this close to Spokane was a bad idea, especially in a civilian area. But he just wouldn't listen, Tatum lamented, 
frustration evident in his voice. Doesn't matter now. We gotta do something, Edgar interjected. Are the civilians in danger? Eric inquired. No, Jimmy said that they were told to stay in the bunker houses until morning, which is presumably when the military would leave, Reed reassured them. They're waiting for us, Devin remarked. We better not disappoint them then. What's their force strength? Tatum queried. Jimmy wasn't sure. Small squad for sure. At least that's all that came into town. Supported by a sniper that was set up on the north side of town, Reed reported. They're definitely waiting on us, Devin affirmed. The question is, how many are waiting on us? Is it just this squad? Or is there a whole battalion waiting on us once we show up? Tatum pondered aloud. My guess is that it's just this squad, Reed offered. Why do you think that? Tatum probed further. Because if it was a whole battalion, they could have just wiped Rosalia off the map, and they didn't. This feels personal, Reed explained. I'm with Reed. This does feel personal. If this was a proper military operation, they wouldn't have gone in shooting. They would have done considerable recon before moving in, Devin concurred. Who's to say that they didn't? Frank interjected. It's been less than three days since that convoy went through. I'd be surprised if they finished the debrief by now. There was already no hope of recovering the payload, so no sense in rushing, Reed countered. This was most likely the recon mission, but it didn't go the way somebody wanted, Devin concluded. Okay, let's run with this assumption. We know we're walking into a trap, we just don't know of how big of one, Tatum said. What about Tekoa? Edgar interjected. The group fell into a moment of contemplative silence before nodding in unanimous agreement. That's a hell of a bold play, Edgar, Reed remarked. That music is blaring and acting like a magnet for those things. Took the long way home from the convoy strike and rode by. There were hundreds of those things trying to get to the speakers in the middle of town, Edgar explained. I like it. If it's just the small strike force, we'll have the upper hand because we know what we're walking into. And if it's the full force, Tatum trailed off. Then we'll at least have a fighting chance to get out. Devin finished Tatum's thought. Okay, I want a full loadout, along with hiking and camping gear to be stationed outside of Tekoa. Because unless we are 100% sure we kill all of them, we're hiking back to camp. We can't risk them following us back here, especially since they appear to have a hard-on for us. Tatum directed, his authority clear. I'll make sure we're packed up good Tatum, Edgar affirmed. Good. Frank and Reed will accompany me to Rosalia, while Devin, Edgar, and Eric get set up in Tekoa, Tatum delegated. They have a sniper down there, Tatum. I can be of use to you down there, Devin offered. You're going to be of bigger use to me in Tekoa. I want you covering the main road into town in case we're coming in hot. Reed, Edgar, see if you can set up a welcoming committee close to that side of town, Tatum instructed. Are you not concerned about the sniper? Reed inquired. Truth be told, I'm not, Tatum admitted. I'm with you guys in thinking this is personal. Which means if it is, they're not going to be killing us from a distance, Tatum reasoned. Are you willing to bet your life on that? Devin pressed. Yep. Willing to bet Reed's life, too, Tatum affirmed without hesitation, a hint of humor lacing his words. Tatum's smile broke the tension in the room, eliciting laughter from everyone present. I appreciate that, Tatum, Reed replied with a smirk. Anytime, Reed, Tatum replied with a playful smack on the shoulder before refocusing. Okay, we're leaving in 15. Devin, help Edgar with the gear. The rest of you help get the word out of what's going on, especially to those in St. Mary's. Everybody needs to be on high alert, Tatum directed as the group dispersed. As they exited the building, Tatum spotted his wife, Maggie, standing nearby, arms crossed and tapping her foot in a familiar gesture of disapproval. Reed nudged him, sensing the tension. She already looks mad, so I won't tell on you, Reed remarked. Appreciate that, Reed, Tatum replied before turning his attention to Maggie. Is this an I told you so situation? Maggie questioned. It is, Tatum admitted. Maggie sighed, shaking her head in resignation. 
I told you hitting that convoy was a bad idea, Maggie reiterated. I know, Maggie, I know. But if we didn't, then it would have isolated us. Maxwell would have cut us off, and the military was going to blame us anyway, Tatum explained. You're right, Maggie conceded, her demeanor softening as she stepped forward, seeking solace in his embrace. Just tell me that you're going to be okay, Maggie implored, her voice laced with worry. I'm going to be okay, Maggie. Like everything else we've been through, this too shall pass, Tatum reassured her. When are you going to be back? Maggie asked. Might be tomorrow, might be a few days. We might be hiking back. Don't want to take any chances with the town, you know? Tatum explained, his gaze reflecting the gravity of the situation. I know. You do what you need to do, and I'll hold things down here, Maggie affirmed. I know you will. In fact, they're lucky I'm not sending you out to deal with them. They wouldn't stand a chance, Tatum joked, attempting to lighten the mood. Maggie chuckled before pulling him into another embrace, both of them aware of the danger involved with the mission, but choosing to ignore it for the moment. Go play the hero. I'll have something special waiting for you when you get back, Maggie encouraged. Tatum offered her a soft smile before heading towards the supply building, his focus now fully on the mission ahead. Chapter 7 Tatum, Reed, and Frank approached cautiously from the southern outskirts of Rosalia halting their vehicle a mile shy of the town's edge, its structures barely discernible in the distance. Tatum peered ahead, his gaze sharp, scanning for any signs of trouble, yet finding none. Despite their knowledge to the contrary, the town appeared deserted. So what's the play? Reed inquired. Tatum deliberated briefly before replying, We're going to park outside of town, this side of the barricade. You two are going to go through the neighborhood, and I'm going straight down Main Street. You know this isn't one of those old westerns, right? Like the bad guy isn't just going to step out in the middle of town square for a duel, Reed remarked skeptically. If it's personal, he just might, Tatum countered. Frank, talk some sense into him, will you? Reed appealed. I'm with Tatum. They called us out, so clearly they want to make a point, Frank said. That's it. I'm cutting you out of the will, Reed threatened jokingly. Oh no, I won't get your porn stash and half-empty bottle of whiskey, Frank mocked. Well, you're missing out, because the internet is gone and that stash is worth its weight in gold, Reed quipped, prompting laughter to fill the vehicle and momentarily dispel the tension. Okay, let's get this show on the road, Tatum said, getting them back on task. Tatum maneuvered the SUV towards the barricade, executing a three-point turn to have it ready for a hasty escape down the highway. Exiting the vehicle, they armed themselves and surveyed the area, only to discover the guards at the barricade lying lifeless. Jesus, what was the point of this? These aren't soldiers, they're good old boys making sure none of those things were getting into town, Reed exclaimed. Taking that convoy must have pissed them off good, Frank speculated. We can't help them, but we can help the people in town. Get moving. Tatum instructed. Frank and Reed acknowledged Tatum's directive with nods before darting westward, infiltrating the neighborhood. They hugged the sides of buildings while Tatum proceeded cautiously along the highway, determined not to lose sight of him. Tatum's stride exuded the confidence of a hero cowboy entering a long oppressed town in a western film, ready to liberate it from the outlaws. Rifle in hand but pointed downward, he conveyed readiness for a confrontation without a concern in the world. A booming voice from the next block interrupted his advance, prompting him to halt in his tracks. Well, what do we have here? You certainly have a set on you, don't you? Sergeant Carter remarked. I heard someone was looking for me. I figured why play cat and mouse when I can just come on out into the open, Tatum replied calmly. Are you one of the ones who killed my friend? Sergeant Carter demanded. It's hard to tell when I don't know who you are, Tatum countered. Oh, forgive me. Where are my manners? I'm Sergeant Carter. I would introduce you to the rest of my men, but at the moment they're strategically placed. And to whom do I have the pleasure? Sergeant Carter said. The name's Tatum. So Tatum, did you kill my friend? Sergeant Carter pressed. Unlikely it was me. 
I was stationed on one of the side roads in case the convoy decided to bypass the town here, Tatum explained. But it was one of your men, wasn't it? One of the men you ordered to hijack that convoy? Sergeant Carter accused. More than likely, yes, it was, Tatum admitted. Tell me, Tatum, did you serve? Sergeant Carter inquired. I did. A few tours in the sandbox, as a matter of fact, Tatum confirmed. Did you ever lose someone you were close to? Sergeant Carter asked. On more than one occasion, Tatum confessed. Did you get the people responsible? Sergeant Carter pressed on. I can't say that I ever had the pleasure, Tatum admitted. And didn't that just eat you up inside? Sergeant Carter questioned. It still does, and it will haunt me until my last days, Tatum confessed. Well, I just found out this morning that one of my friends, Sergeant Alvarez, was killed by you militia folks, and it's been eating me up all day. Unlike you, however, I've been doing something about it, Sergeant Carter stated firmly. Is killing civilians what you call doing something about it? Tatum challenged. They stopped being innocent the moment you put a gun in their hands and had them pointed in our direction. You had no right to what was in those trucks, and a lot of good people died because you wanted to play highway robber, Sergeant Carter accused. Tatum stood there for a moment before letting out a laugh. Are you seriously laughing right now? Sergeant Carter questioned incredulously. Carter emerged from the side of the building on the next block, rifle held in a similar downward position as Tatum's. His voice trembled with rage as he confronted Tatum. Are you really laughing at my dead friends? Carter demanded. Of course not. I have nothing but respect for people who put their lives on the line for their country and fellow man, Tatum responded calmly. I'm laughing at your absurd notion that what was in those trucks were yours. We're the military in the biggest, most important war the world has ever seen, the war for survival against the undead. What we need, we take, because it's ours, Carter asserted. Tatum chuckled again, provoking further anger from Carter. You're one of those true believers, huh? Yeah, I was like that for a while. Didn't take long for it to wear off. But I do have to correct you on something, Tatum interjected. And that would be? Carter inquired. When you guys cut and ran at the beginning of all this, people like me and my men fought and died to protect the people you left behind. We're the ones who fought and bled to secure the resources. And you act surprised when we fight back? You really should get out of base camp a little more, Sergeant Tatum rebuked. As Carter began to respond, Tatum noticed a slight movement out of the corner of his eye in the window of the neighboring house. Initially mistaking it for Reed or Frank, Tatum discerned military fatigues. But you know what I hate more than a thief accusing me of stealing? Tatum continued. What's that, Tatum? Carter asked. A thief accusing me of stealing who thinks they can get the drop on me, Tatum declared. Tatum swiftly pivoted, unleashing a rapid burst of gunfire towards the house, shattering the window and forcing Carter's man to the ground. Reacting swiftly, Sergeant Carter returned fire but his shots missed as Tatum lunged through the shattered glass door of a small business along Main Street. Bullets tore through the storefront as Tatum scrambled towards the rear of the store, keeping his profile low to avoid incoming fire. He returned a few shots in an attempt to suppress the gunmen and deter pursuit. Reaching the back counter of the store, Tatum braced himself and popped up, training his weapon towards the front as the onslaught of bullets gradually subsided. He scanned the area for any signs of movement but found none. Move, man, move, Tatum urged himself. Tatum broke away from the counter, darting towards the back storeroom. Hastening to the rear door, he flung it open, anticipating freedom, only to be met with a bullet striking the door frame, compelling him to hastily retreat back inside. Well, I found the sniper. Damn it, Tatum muttered to himself, frustration evident in his voice. Surveying the scene cautiously from behind cover, Tatum realized the futility of attempting to escape through the back. With no viable cover in sight, he resigned himself to the only option available. Well, looks like I'm going out the front, Tatum muttered grimly. Grabbing his radio, Tatum relayed the situation to his comrades with urgency. Found the sniper, somewhere to the east. I'm pinned down in one of the stores. I'm going to need help getting out of this one, Tatum transmitted. 
We got you, Tatum. Hang tight. Frank's reassuring response crackled through the radio. Tatum set the radio down and positioned himself near the storeroom door, crouching low and aiming his rifle towards the front of the store. As he waited, Sergeant Carter's voice sliced through the tense atmosphere once more. Well, that was all very dramatic, Tatum, but it didn't really accomplish a lot. Now did it? Carter taunted. I wouldn't say that. I got in a little cardio. That's never a bad thing, Tatum retorted, injecting a hint of sarcasm into his response. Carter chuckled briefly before regaining his composure and returning to the matter at hand. So, I'm going to make this easy on you, Tatum. You're going to tell me where the rest of your men are, and I don't just mean the ones you came with. I mean everybody who was involved in the murder of my friend and comrades. Then you're going to give me every bit of information you have on anybody else that is taking up arms against us, Carter demanded. Oh, is that all? I would be negligent in my duties if I didn't ask what I got out of this deal, Tatum replied. Well, I could promise you the world. Tell you that if you cooperate that we'd provide you and yours with food and safety. But you and I both know that's never going to happen. So I'll do the only thing I can, which is give you a simple choice. You can either come back to Spokane as my prisoner, or I can put a round between your eyes and put you down quickly, Carter offered, his tone dripping with menace. As enticing as those options are, I'm afraid I'm going to have to politely decline your offer, Tatum countered coolly. On the one hand, that's a shame, because it would have been nice to do this professionally. On the other hand, however, I'm kind of happy that you turned me down, because it means I get to exact proper revenge on you for the death of Sergeant Alvarez. When I'm done with you, you're going to wish you chose the bullet through the head. In fact, you're going to be begging for it. Carter threatened with chilling resolve. Well, you know where I am. Good luck in trying to get me out of here, though, Tatum retorted defiantly. Tatum's senses heightened as Carter fell silent, his lack of response raising Tatum's concern. With focused intensity, he scanned the store in front of him, peering through the shelves and displays to the street, searching for any signs of movement. Suddenly, a noise emanated from the back door of the storeroom, as if someone were attempting to open it gently from the outside. Reacting swiftly, Tatum broke from his position, sprinting towards the door and delivering a forceful kick just as it began to open. The metal door swung halfway open before halting abruptly, accompanied by a grunt from the man it had struck in the face. With lightning reflexes, Tatum darted to the side as sunlight bathed his body, knowing he was likely visible to the sniper. His instincts proved correct as a bullet impacted the wall behind him, narrowly missing its mark. Reacting swiftly, Tatum raised his rifle and fired several rounds at the bottom of the door, his shot striking the ground with force. He glimpsed the fleeting shadows of two men fleeing from the scene. Quickly seizing the radio, Tatum yelled into it urgently. Where are you guys at? I'm running out of time here, he exclaimed. We'll be on your position in two minutes. Be ready to move. Chapter 8 Frank and Reed moved stealthily through the neighborhood, trailing behind Tatum who stood conversing with an unidentified figure in the street. They kept their distance, a couple of blocks away from the highway, cautious not to draw too close. Reed voiced his curiosity, who the hell is he talking to? Frank speculated, my guess is the ringleader. Anyone else would have probably shot him. Let's keep moving, Reed urged. We need to find where the rest of these assholes are hiding. As they emerged from their concealment, advancing toward the next house on the block, the sound of gunfire erupted, prompting both of them to seek cover. Damn it, they're shooting at him, Frank cursed. They paused, straining to pinpoint the source of the gunfire amidst the cacophony of bullets striking wood and glass. He's in a store, come on, Reed urged, and the two men swiftly retraced their steps, sprinting as the gunfire abated slightly. Concern gnawed at them, fearing Tatum might have fallen, yet clinging to hope for his safety. Advancing toward the highway, one block down from the store where Tatum sought refuge, they observed a pair of armed men positioned on either side, still hunkered down and cautiously peering around the corner. Suddenly, Frank's radio crackled to life. Found the sniper, somewhere to the east. I'm pinned down in one of the stores. I'm going to need help getting out of this one. Tatum said. We got you, Tatum. Hang tight, 
Frank replied. Frank lowered the radio, then glanced at his brother Reed. Well, I know we got him, but how? Frank pondered aloud. We can take out the two by the front of the store, clear the path for him, Reed suggested, and become sitting ducks for the guys covering them. It's no good, Frank countered. We can't just sit here with our thumbs up our asses, Reed retorted. I understand that, but we can't just rush in without A. Frank's words were cut short by the sudden crack of a gunshot, the bullet striking the side of the house they were using for cover. Reacting swiftly, they returned fire, though uncertain of the shooter's location. They wasted no time, swiftly making their way to the closest door of the house. Frank braced himself, lowering his shoulder to crash through the door, but stumbled and fell as he tripped. Reed continued firing as Frank scrambled to his feet, bullets tearing through the structure around them. To get to the other side of the house. I got an idea. Frank shouted over the gunfire. Without a word of dissent, Reed followed his brother as they sprinted through the house, reaching a bedroom on the side. Frank wasted no time. He seized a chair and hurled it through the window with all his strength. The shattering glass cleared their path. Frank leaped out first, swiftly scanning the surroundings for any lurking threats, his relief palpable as he found none. As Reed joined him, ready to head back towards the store, Frank halted him in his tracks. What are you doing? Reed questioned. We don't know how many there are or where they're hiding, Frank replied firmly. We can't just leave him in there, Reed insisted. We're not. I told you that I had an idea, so come on, Frank urged. Reed recognized the seriousness of Frank's resolve, so he simply nodded and gave him a reassuring pat on the back. Okay, it's on you. Let's go, Reed affirmed. The duo sprinted away from the escalating confrontation, seeking refuge within the labyrinthine streets of the neighborhood. They pushed themselves hard, their breaths labored, punctuated by the distant crack of gunfire. Moments later, they caught sight of the waiting SUV, still stationed and ready for their escape. Once more, the radio crackled to life. Where are you guys at? I'm running out of time here. Tatum's urgent voice pierced through the static. We'll be on your position in two minutes. Be ready to move. Frank responded briskly, swiftly setting down the radio before commandeering the driver's seat of the SUV. Reed slid into the back, methodically loading a fresh magazine into his rifle while rolling down both windows. You watch your head up there. We're going to be a big target for that sniper when we come around the back, Reed cautioned. It's a good thing we're not going around the back then, Frank retorted. Reed pondered his brother's words for a moment before exhaling heavily. Just don't get me killed, Frank. No promises, Frank quipped with a wry grin. Frank floored the gas pedal, executing a swift turn and steering the SUV away from the direct route toward town. Instead, he veered down the winding streets of the neighborhood. Reed, sensing his brother's plan without needing it spelled out, released a resigned sigh, preparing himself mentally for the daring maneuver Frank was about to attempt. Frank maneuvered the vehicle through the maze-like streets, accelerating down several blocks before veering northward. Eventually, they reached the road leading to the target store. Halting in the middle of the road, Frank grabbed the radio, his voice resolute as he communicated their approach. We're coming in through the front, Tatum. 20 seconds, shotgun position. Window is down so you can cover us, Frank announced. You're a maniac, Frank, but I like it. I'm ready, Tatum's response crackled through the radio. You good, Reed? Frank asked his brother. As ready as I'm ever going to be, Reed replied. With his handgun resting on his lap, Frank slammed his foot on the gas pedal, propelling the SUV forward with alarming speed down the street toward the store, situated just off to the left of the side street. Approaching the highway, Frank veered sharply to the left, angling towards the store. Breaking hard at the last moment, the SUV maintained enough momentum to leap over the curb, crashing into the storefront with a deafening impact. Glass shattered and wood splintered as the vehicle plowed through the front of the store, causing the two guards stationed outside to scatter for cover. As the vehicle came to a halt, gunshots erupted from behind them, shattering the back windshield. Reed swiftly sat up, returning fire as he surveyed their surroundings. 
Gunmen emerged from both sides of the store, their shots joined by gunfire from a house across the street. Reed emptied half a magazine in response, providing cover fire as Tatum dashed to the SUV and leaped aboard. Go, 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 Tatum yelled. Frank swiftly shifted the SUV into reverse, flooring the gas pedal. The vehicle lurched backward, gaining speed rapidly. As he passed by, Frank extended his handgun out of the window, firing several shots toward the man on his side. Uncertain if his shots hit their mark, Frank nonetheless succeeded in momentarily halting the man's gunfire, which was enough of a reprieve for him. The other occupants of the SUV joined in, unleashing a barrage of bullets towards any perceived threat. As incoming fire peppered their vehicle, Frank maintained his focus on accelerating in reverse, his gaze shifting between the rearview mirror and the terrain behind them. Instead of fleeing onto the highway, Frank opted to continue their backward momentum, steering the SUV towards the yard adjacent to the house across the street. The uneven terrain made for a bumpy ride, but Frank remained steadfast, determined to navigate them to safety. Finally back on the road, Frank continued driving in reverse until he reached the next street, where he executed a sharp turn, aligning the vehicle in the correct direction. Shifting gears into drive, he accelerated, swiftly guiding them to the outskirts of town, navigating through yards to evade pursuit. The rugged terrain jostled them about for a few moments until they reached the highway. Frank maintained high speed for another mile before coming to a stop. Reed remained vigilant, his rifle trained on the highway, but no trouble materialized. Well, that was fun, Frank remarked, a touch of sarcasm in his tone. Yeah, not our most productive visit to the town, Tatum concurred. Did you figure out who was after us? Frank inquired. Some asshole sergeant. Apparently one of the people on the convoy was his friend, and he's none too pleased that he died, Tatum explained. Well, that's a relief, Reed interjected. That's a relief? Frank echoed, incredulous. Yeah, it's a small group with a vendetta, not the full force of the military. We can handle the former. Not so sure about the latter, Reed reasoned. So what are we doing? Are we waiting for them to follow? Or are we just calling it a day? Frank pressed. They are already following us, Reed stated matter-of-factly. Frank and Tatum shared a moment of panic as they anxiously scanned the highway behind them, but to their relief, there was no sign of a pursuing vehicle. I don't see anything, Frank remarked, his voice tinged with uncertainty. Look up, Reed directed. Following Reed's instruction, both Frank and Tatum spotted a drone hovering in the air above them. You know, that's just insulting. Do they really think we're so stupid that we wouldn't notice that following us? Frank scoffed incredulously. I mean, you did just drive an SUV through the front of a store. That's not exactly rational behavior, Reed pointed out. Yeah, but it worked though, Frank retorted with a chuckle. Luck is not intelligence, brother, Reed countered prompting Frank to burst into laughter as Tatum playfully smacked his arm. Come on, let's get going. Just don't go too fast. We wouldn't want to lose them, Tatum urged. Frank acknowledged Tatum's instruction with a nod, steering the vehicle down the highway toward the trap town of Tekoa. Meanwhile, Reed maintained a vigilant watch over the drone, ensuring it trailed their movements. Twenty tense minutes passed, during which Reed remained fixated on the drone's movements stop here. We're about a mile away from Tekoa. Do you think they can see it from there? Tatum directed. Yeah, they should know there's a town up ahead but not be able to see what's waiting for them, Reed confirmed. Do you think you can hit that drone from here? Tatum inquired. Reed responded with a chuckle as he adjusted his scope. Climbing into the back of the SUV, he positioned himself with his rifle protruding out of the rear window. With steady hands, he took careful aim, squeezing the trigger and sending a single round skyward. A moment later, a satisfying explosion erupted from the drone, shattering it into multiple pieces as it spiraled downwards to the ground below. Tatum swiftly grabbed the radio. Devin, do you guys copy? We're here, Tatum. What's your 20? Devin's voice crackled through the radio. A mile outside of town. Hostiles are a couple miles behind us. Are you guys ready? Tatum inquired. We're in position and ready to strike, Devin confirmed. Good. 
Let's show these guys that they picked the wrong fight. It's on. The end.